This episode is brought to you by VPP Simplified. Now you can get element by element tracking and guidance for your VPP journey. Every aspect of the VPP requirements in one easy to use interactive spreadsheet. Achieving VPP star status can be tough, but understanding what it takes to get there can be simplified. This VPP gap tool will help you do that. Go to vppsimplified.com for more information. Welcome to the Safety Pro Podcast, where we help you manage workplace safety one episode at a time. And now, your very own Safety Pro, Blaine J. Hoffman. Welcome to another episode of the Safety Pro Podcast. In this episode, I will talk about preparing for an OSHA inspection and how to best handle the event should one occur. Here, my focus will be what to do up front before this occurs and Should a Compliance Safety and Health Officer, or CSHO, arrive at your facility, what to expect, and what you should have ready to make it go smoother. I will also talk briefly about how to handle any alleged violations and uh, potential citations that come your way. Let's first get some definitions out of the way so we are all on the same page. I already mentioned the CSHO, or the Compliance Safety and Health Officer. This is the federal OSHA employee who conducts inspections for OSHA, also known as the OSHA inspector. We also have the general duty clause. Uh, We all should be familiar with this one. This is a section of the Occupational Safety and Health Act, Section 5A1, that requires employers to protect employees from recognized serious hazards, regardless of whether there is a specific standard addressing that hazard. OSHA often uses the general duty clause to cite employers for not protecting workers from ergonomic type of hazards, workplace violence, and even heat stress because no specific standards exist for those hazards as of yet. Of course, we have OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, the federal agency that sets and enforces worker safety and health laws But we also have the OSHA Act, the Occupational Safety and Health Act of 1970. That is basically enabling legislation for OSHA. That was the federal act that was able to stand up the administration to create the the rules, regulations, and, and enforce them. We have repeat violations. That's a hazardous or violative condition that is the same or similar to a previously cited condition in the past five years at either the same establishment or another establishment of the same company under federal OSHA jurisdiction. We also have serious violations. This is where there is a substantial probability that death or serious physical harm could result and the employer knew or should have known of the hazard. Then we have willful violations. Now this one, you you don't want these, but a willful is a violation that the employer intentionally and knowingly commits. And, And, you know, this is something where, you know, supervisors get involved. Um, if you can, basically point to a supervisor knowing or having knowledge and consciously said, no, we're going to do this anyway, and does not do anything about it. So you can get to some serious legal problems here with willful violations. We also have other than serious violations, and then we have uh, de minimis violations. The de minimis are, you know, it doesn't put anybody at risk or at harm. Maybe it is an administrative type of a violation, but a violation nonetheless. And um, usually de minimis violations don't come with any abatement period or penalty amount. And, uh, but those are sort of, that's the range of the types of violations that you could receive or see some uh, information on. And I'll have uh, all these in the show notes as well for you. Look, we're going to get into, you know, the arrival and inspection process and how to best handle these and ultimately what you can do to better prepare your company. But first, you're going to have to go and check out our incredible partners in safety, Who's On Location. Go to the website, whosonlocation.com, where you're going to find a complete digital solution 
for employee management, time management, visitor management, contractor management, and even evacuation management at one location or many locations across the country or around the world. You can manage visitors, contractors, conduct evacuations, and track who's safe. The web apps work across multiple platforms. Uh, you'll be able to use them on many different devices, and it puts the power of keeping track of safety and security in the palm of your hand. You're, you're not going to be disappointed with these uh, set of services here. Go to whosonlocation.com. Sign up for a 30-day free trial, no credit card required. You get to try all of the features. Unlike other trials where it's sort of a light version of the product, you don't really get to you know, the full drive experience. You get to do that with Who's On Location. Again, go to whosonlocation.com, get a 30-day free trial, start managing safety and security at your locations and remote locations today. Another incredible partner in safety that you have to know more about, Mighty Line Tape. Go to MightyLineTape.com forward slash podcast, get a free sample of the best, the industry best floor tape that you can get. There's floor tape and then there's Mighty Line Tape. Okay, trust me on this. Why would you use essentially duct tape, you know, to mark your warehouse floors, factory floors, freezer floors? Especially when, you know, marking aisles, delineating pedestrian ways and forklift routes uh, is so critical to the safety of your operations. Why would you rely on something so inferior? You know, Mighty Line tape is seven times thicker than the average floor tape. It has a beveled edge, so forklifts, scissor lifts, carts, you know, that type of traffic, it's going to hold up over time. You know, you can have the confidence that it's going to stay in its place and be there over the long haul. They have centerline glow tape, uh, you know, power outages, you know, being able to see that line during evacuations or even for forklift traffic in low light conditions. They have freezer floor tape for harsh, uh, you know, conditions, temperatures. They have all kinds of stuff. Get a free sample. Go to MightyLineTape.com forward slash podcast. It's made here in the USA. It leaves very little uh, residue. It's easy to apply and remove. Why would you mess around with an inferior product or even painting your floor and all of that work going in and, and supplies and materials going into painting stripes. Go to MightyLineTape.com forward slash podcast. While you're there, you'll notice you can catch past episodes of the Safety Pro Podcast right there on their website. Again, MightyLineTape.com forward slash podcast. Okay, so let's get into, you know, what to do when the inspection starts or, you know, OSHA's knocking, right? That's the question we often get. First, you need to understand OSHA has the right to inspect places of work. A question I get is more specifically, and this is more often than I'm comfortable with, is, hey, uh, can I require OSHA to come back with a warrant? You know, can I tell them they can't come in? Um, yeah, the answer, short answer is yes, you could. Employers can exercise their constitutional rights to request a warrant. However, there is a fairly low threshold for OSHA to obtain a warrant and they will come back with a warrant. They'll probably come back with two or three other people to help facilitate, you know, turning over every single rock that they possibly can, you know, within the scope of their, of their visit, of course. But look, it doesn't send the right message at all. Uh, so this is not advised in many cases, and it ju it's just not going to show your willingness to cooperate. Instead, use your right to an opening conference upon their arrival, which brings me to my next point. When the compliance officer arrives, avoid showing a negative attitude, creating a bad first impression. You know, this could set your facility up for failure. So practice having a positive attitude towards the compliance officers. Being polite can put the inspector at ease and create a positive environment. Uh, you might even enjoy, enjoy and learn something from the inspector. I know it sounds crazy, but look, we those of us who have been through these um, many, many times, we know that it's not as bad as it seems. If it turns out badly for you, it isn't the compliance officer nine times out of 10. It's them doing their job and it's, you know, the processes and management systems that we're supposed to have in place that are causing us grief, right? The lack thereof, I should say. So listen, keep that in mind. The next point is know the reasons that prompted 
the inspection, right? Inspections can be triggered in a variety of ways, such as reports of serious injuries, complaints, even employee complaints, contractor complaints. Don't underestimate those. You know, you've got contractors coming in and out of your facility, and if it's unkept, unsafe, hazardous, they experience a near miss and they're not happy. You know, that employee is, especially if they're not a, an employee of yours, they're more likely to call OSHA and not care about, you know, naming who, you know, saying who they are and where they were working and what they were doing. So keep that in mind. Inspections can also be triggered by targeting or emphasis programs and even in plain view hazard situations. And this is a good one. If you have a factory that's right near a highway or a major road, you've got your maintenance employees up on the roof, right on the edge of the roof, looking over the end, you know, throwing a tool down, you know, just so happens, dumb luck, timing's not working out for you. A compliance officer drives by and sees this, that's sort of probable cause right there, it's in plain view. They can just pull right into your parking lot. Same thing with a, with a job site, with a construction site. People up, you know, on a roof or a house or several houses doing you know, framing or roof work and clearly, you know, no fall protection, things like that. Uh, scaffolds are a good one. Looking at a scaffold, you can almost, you don't even have to get near a scaffold sometimes to see, you know, components are missing, boards are missing. It's just a half-baked, you know, operation. You know, OSHA's going to pull right in. Trenches, another great, I, a great example that I've experienced personally, you know, in dealing with trenching and excavating with those companies in my past. You drive by, you can easily see if, you know, one, there's a ladder sticking out of a trench. Two, you can see if there's evidence of shielding, shoring, or trench boxes on site. Either you see the components laying around or you can see the trench shield sticking up a little bit. But, you know, how, how employees are walking around. And then you get into roadways. You get, you know, employees that are out, you know, setting out cones. They don't have high-vis apparel. All these things, all it takes is somebody to see them, and boom, they're on. They're on board. So just keep this in mind. You can judge a book by its cover. <laughs> so, you know, we don't want to, we don't, certainly don't want to tell our children this or, you know, but I think you get what I'm saying. If it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, it might be a violation. So bottom line, know the reasons that prompt in most inspections uh, so that you can, you know, help stave those off. You know, they're seldom at random and note that some smaller workplaces in low hazard industries may even be exempt from certain types of inspections. OSHA has a compliance document. It's called Enforcement Exemptions and Limitations Under the Appropriations Act. And I'll have a link in the show notes so you can read read up a, on a little bit about those. Uh, but be careful. Just because uh, something doesn't apply, a standard or a reg, doesn't mean it's you know not a great idea to enforce it anyway or follow it anyway. So keep that in mind. Another point here. Learn the phases of an OSHA inspection. This is going to help it go smoother, and it's going to help ensure that you exercise your rights as an employer and OSHA, you know, exercise their responsibilities during the inspection process. So inspections will consist of an opening conference, records review, walkthrough inspection, and closing conference. And this scales based on the scope of the inspection as to why they're there, right? So if they're there to look at, you know, there was a forklift incident and they want to see forklift training and maintenance records, and inspection records, and then they want to go and look at some of the forklifts and talk to a couple of operators and then boom, they're out uh, versus, you know, we want to see, let's say you have a major lumber chain across many states. You may have sort of the systemic review of your policies, procedures, and programs where they're going to visit multiple locations in multiple jurisdictions. That's a little different. But the scale is so it scales, but they're still going to follow the same, you know, the same phases are still going to be in place and they're still required to be conducted in that order. Now, any citations that do result, they will not be issued during the inspection. Those come later and only the area director, the OSHA area director can issue such citations. Now, right from the onset, you have to make sure you get this one right. You have to verify the compliance safety and health officer's credentials. Always ask to see their credentials. Now, if you've never seen credentials from um, an OSHA inspection uh, officer, compliance officer, then you're probably not going to know what you're looking at. But guess what? You can always contact the area director uh, or the area office, I should say, 
to verify their identity. And it's, and, you know, they get this all the time because sometimes, you know, people are like, I've never seen this ID before. I don't know what it means. You could be anybody coming in here telling me you need to go come look at our factory and, you know, our products and processes. I'm going to call the uh, area office. If you don't mind, just give me five minutes. You could do it right in front of them and say, hey, I have a gentleman here who, um, here's, here's his name. And he's saying he's, and they'll say, they'll confirm, yeah, we got a, uh, you know, a scheduled inspection or something like that. Um, so make sure you get their credentials up front, identify them. Next, get a clear understanding as, you know, to the proposed scope of the inspection. They should generally stick to that scope. This means what do they want to see? What do they want to look at? What do they want to review? A specific process, part of the facility, program review, et cetera. This tells you exactly how to narrow the visit. In other words, where to take them and where not to take them through your facilities, job sites, things like that, okay? Because remember what I said earlier, anything along the way that's in plain sight, they're able to pick up and run with. So you don't want that scope creep. This isn't an insider tip on how to avoid your responsibilities under the Occupational Safety and Health Act, not at all. It's just you have that right and uh, you know, you can exercise that right. But I'm going to, when when I wrap all this up here toward the end, you know, I'll, I'll kind of let you on a on some insider baseball and some free uh, advice from a consultant that, you know, has helped many companies over the years improve safety and health management systems and even partner with OSHA for best in class safety under the VPP. So I'll give you some, some tips on, on how to handle all this. But look, you have those rights. You, you want to know the scope of the visit. You want to be able to limit that liability and then um, be able to manage hazards, uh, find and, and, and mitigate hazards as, you know, internally as much as possible. You're in a much better position to do that, and you should do that quickly and proactively. But get an understanding as to the scope, okay? Next, you're going to want to have documents ready. So be prepared. The OSHA compliance officer will look for documentation. And um, just, for example, uh, injuries and illness records, you're going to want to keep those up to date, you're going to want to keep them orderly, and you're going to want to keep them in one location. You're, I would go away from a paper program. If you go to a digital management system for injuries and illnesses, this is so much easier. I mean, you could have it in the palm of your hand. You can print a loss run report. You can uh, do, do several things at the push of a couple of thumbs, right? And you'll have this stuff. Uh, so really, you should be looking into a digital management system for all these types of things. Uh, and that goes for safety data sheets, training records uh, and documentation, inspections and audits that have been conducted and findings with photos. If you have a digital management system, this all becomes, I'm not kidding, so much easier, more efficient, and it's gonna protect you. Think about the risk you're putting yourself or the company in when you go to a, a manual paper-based system. Everything from I'm not kidding, typos, I've seen it, to forgetting to check a box or filling out a line on an accident report that OSHA requires, like, I don't know, date of birth, date of hire. It, again, administrative, but records violations are always in the top 10, certainly the top 20 most frequently cited violations across the country. And it's because it's easy to miss something when you have a paper-based system and you know, you, another wrinkle here is you have somebody at one location in the state or even out of state filling this out and then faxing or emailing an image to a benefits administrator or workers comp manager, you know, somebody in another location in an admin function, and they don't follow up and say, hey, you didn't fill out your date of hire or you didn't fill out your date of birth or, hey, your home address isn't on here. You know, they just file it and they send it off to get paid by insurance or comp. And it goes into a drawer. Two years later, you get a five-year records review, and bam, you have 15, 20 of these that are incomplete, and you get violations. All right, so there's my soapbox is going away now. Uh, look, go look into digital solutions for this. Trust me, you won't be disappointed. Essentially, you should maintain review and keep documents in a place where you or an assigned supervisor can easily find and present them to the compliance officer. And remember that OSHA could show up at any time. They'll usually arrive during business hours, but an inspection 
prompted by a serious workplace injury or, God forbid, a fatality during any shift could mean a knock at the door in the middle of the night. So be prepared, have drills, or at least tabletop with your leadership team and staff members and supervisors. Hey, if we had an OSHA uh, compliance officer come to our facility on a Saturday night at, you know, 1 a.m., you know, or Sunday morning at 1 a.m., I should say, are we prepared? Are, are the folks that are working there, do they know what to say and do to facilitate that inspection, that visit? That's important. And part of that starts with knowing how to access all the documents that they're going to need, that they're going to request. So I mentioned inspections, right, that they may ask for that. Here's a quick note about self-audits or inspections. OSHA has never officially stated that they will not use self-audits. However, in a final policy published in the Federal Register, OSHA stated that the agency will not routinely, I'm using air quotes, routinely request to see self-audit reports at the initial, you know, inspection process up front. And the agency will not use self-audit reports as a means of identifying hazards upon which to focus during an inspection. So we call this phishing. Um, a lot of it, a lot of folks in the industry, you know, whether it was right or wrong, they brought up a valid point that they they noticed. Hey, compliance officers show up and they go. First thing I ask for is, I want to see your self inspections, your audits, and you're documenting hazards in these inspections. And then they'll go and look for those when they didn't have that scoped out from the onset. Onset, they were just kind of rolling the dice. I'm not saying this did happen, but this was the impression or the perception the industry had. So this is how OSHA addressed it. And so instead of focusing on that, what I want to give you is here's another great tip for you. It's never, um, it's always served me well. It's never gone wrong and it's not going to hurt you. It's just going to help you. Okay. A tip on uh, audits. You do not document the violation. You document the corrective action. What I mean by this is, if a fire exit is blocked, okay, yeah, you can categorize the hazard as blocked fire exit or egress issue in general, but document what was done to correct the hazard, and I would go beyond that instance at that location. I moved the skid off of, you know, out of the aisle and then have a photo, which photos were great, okay, to document corrective action. But maybe, say, conducted a safety huddle at the next shift change, got with the material handlers and um, had them, you know, put new floor marking down around, you know, the fire exits, path to the fire exits around the facility. How did you take this out to the rest of the fire exits? Look, go a little deeper, but document that activity, document the corrective action. That's what OSHA should be looking at when they see self-inspections. They should see that you're identifying things and you're improving the workplace. You, you have to really, really, really be diligent about this. Don't just document a hazard and write it up and then that's it. Document the corrective action, okay? Just, just a tip for you. OSHA has also stated that where a voluntary self-audit identifies a hazardous condition and the employer has corrected the condition prior to the inspection and has taken the appropriate steps to prevent recurrence, they will refrain from issuing a citation. Even if the violation existed within the six month limitation period during which OSHA is authorized to issue citations. Keep that in mind. If OSHA is prompted to come out, let's say it's an employee complaint, they knock on the door and that very complaint was already addressed through internal processes. Maybe the employee Maybe a different employee submitted a safety concern through your normal channels. Verbal, maybe got through maintenance and put in a work order. Maybe you have a system, a digital system. Again, highly recommended where they submitted a safety concern and then you addressed it. And it just so happens they came in after. That's it. That's what they want to see. Okay. So keep that in mind. Always encourage and foster a culture of ownership for safety and reporting and raising a hand and saying that this isn't right, we need to get this fixed. So that's always good. Something else to consider during any inspections, 
photographs and video, right? Take photographs, uh, video of the same things the OSHA inspector does. Keep in mind, OSHA has the right to take photographs during inspections. It's a good idea for employers to duplicate this effort. Employers must also remember that OSHA does have the right to photograph in confidential areas, in instances where there are trade secrets. OSHA also has special privacy procedures to follow with regards to maintaining the case file documentation. So keep that in mind. Lawyers get get ruffle, uh, ruffle their feathers on this one, but they can still do it. That doesn't mean they will, depending upon what they're trying to document, but they do have that right. As for videos, the same rules apply as taking photos, all right? Now, I remember during one fatality I was investigating and uh, helping a company uh, get through, the compliance officer informed me of his intent to roll tape, right? He showed me the camera, the video camera, how he would turn it on, the light indicating that it was on, etc. He he even told me that he would not record me or ask me any questions during the recording. It was simply to capture the worksite and the equipment that was involved in the fatality to document that. He really made it a point to ensure that I was comfortable. I mean, he even dispelled the myth that, you know, compliance officers would pretend they turn the camera off but keep secretly recording and start conversations and ask questions to, you know, to gain evidence. Look, this is not how they operate. I was there alone on a remote site without an attorney. I was the only one there representing the company during a fatality. I mean, this is, this is actually, you know, uh, just a couple of days after it occurred. And I was walking through a site where a 20-year employee of the company was killed. A very sensitive and emotional time. They are highly trained, these compliance officers. Um, and more importantly, they're also humans. They have empathy like anyone else. So I was so impressed by this compliance officer that, you know, we've stayed in touch over the years. Um, he still works for OSHA. And from time to time, we collaborate uh, on, on things, especially, you know, with my work with VPP, talking to me about, you know, some best practices. And I've called him to get his take on, you know, unique situations. You know, developing a strong working relationship with OSHA, it's, it's just a good thing, okay? But my experience... Uh, with that individual, you know, that really showed me the training and the attitude that the administration wants their compliance officers to have. And, you know, I, I was just impressed. But look, if they're standing there taking a photo, stand there and take a photo. I'll tell you another quick story. In uh, Columbus, Ohio, many years ago, we had a compliance officer show up at a site and it was under construction multi-story, uh, large, you know, outdoor mall type of project. Compliance officer starts taking a photo of, you know, some, something. There was a propane tank uh, sitting on a poured uh, footer and up against a, you know, is right next to a, a support column, right? So the propane tank was in use. They had an attachment uh, on the end of the propane tank and they were heating some water for mortar mix because it was cold this morning so they had to have the water at a certain temperature and they were using it he stands there he takes a picture and walks on so i stood there i took a picture in the same direction and walked on i, I didn't realize what he was after you know at the time so during the closing the sort of the um you know end of the inspection i said hey i noticed you took several photos and he said well i really i'm just going to do some further research in certain areas and if i have any questions on those um, you know, he took many photos. So, I uh, well, it turns out we got certified mail. We got some, what, three citations. One of them was a propane tank, not secured, chained. And, you know, I said, well, wait a minute. At the time, the, the construction standards indicated, you know, it was in use and uh, it was set upon a stable surface. I, I remember the language uh, at the time was very specific. I don't know if it's changed since then. I'll have to look that up by memory isn't as good as it used to be. But I went to the informal conference, you know, we got it vacated, but basically I was able to demonstrate that it was, it was being used. His photo, and I don't think he did it on purpose. He only took a photo of the propane tank sitting there and you can see the hose coming off the tank, but then it goes out of the frame and, and it's clearly got no chain. And to anybody, any outside observer, it looks like that propane tank is just sitting there 
and it's not chained. It's not chained up. But the photo I took, a wide out photo, wide angle, shows a worker actually using the propane tank that you know you can they can carry from column to column to heat up the water for this mortar mix. I clearly was able to demonstrate that it was in use. It was being used, and it was set upon a stable surface. It had a manufactured base. Uh, it was made for that. It wasn't in storage or anything like that. So, look, I you know I'm rambling, but we all have war stories, right? Um, it helped. So take a photo if they take a photo. All right, it's it's just good practice. Uh, this next tip, it's going to seem like an obvious one, but I am still surprised at you know when folks call me and go, "Hey, Blaine, I got a quick question for you. Can you help me out?" Uh, OSHA swung by, and you know they walked through. We had a closing conference, and 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 they said they get, they he said three things that you know concerned him that are gonna you know we're gonna need to address. And I'm like, oh wait, you had the closing conference. You mean they left? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, dude, you <laughs> you could have fixed those. Those are minor. You could have fixed them right in front of him and to have that document. Um, we had I had another uh, job site that we had uh, an OSHA site uh, OSHA visit, I should say. Um, it, it, we it didn't get any we didn't get any citations. But she came out and again, professional, very cordial, doing her job, uh, fantastic job she did as well. Two items she found, very minor, right away, right away. So my tip here on this one is always correct hazards when they are there, if possible. So part of your prep for, you know, what if OSHA shows up is have a small team of, you know, maintenance, an engineer, maybe a couple of uh, workers. Uh, have a small tiger team, if you will, always ready to go on each shift because you're going to want to walk through the inspection with the compliance officer. And as he or she points things out, you can just snap and have maintenance go grab some tools or have an engineer address an issue with a, a machine. You want those mitigated and documented right then and there. That way you have nothing, no reason for them to come back. That doesn't mean you may not get a citation, but they don't have to come back and follow up to make sure that it was done. You don't have to worry about doing photos and writing a dissertation of what you did to correct the hazard and, you know, within a prescribed period of time. Okay. It's open and shut. And another, it's three words that I've used over the years. Again, it's dead on and you're not going to go wrong with this. People always ask. What do I do if OSHA shows up? I mean, we're running through this right here. I'm giving you some good, some good info, but the bottom line at the end of the day are three words. Be in compliance. Understand the OSHA regulations that apply to you and your industry, okay? That's it. You have to. That is your job as the employer, not OSHA's job. OSHA's job isn't to come in and tell you what you should know, okay? Ignorance of the law is no defense. You need to understand these rules and regulations and how to best comply with them and set up your operations accordingly. So, you know, you're going to have, they'll, you'll have less reason to fear an OSHA inspection if you're conducting self-inspections, looking for missing machine guards, blocked fire exits, unkept work areas, fall hazards, you know, preparing your work, workplace for a compliance officer. It's going to depend on your ability to consistently identify and correct known hazards, right? but you need to get into this rhythm. For each alleged violation found during the inspection, the compliance officer either will have discussed or will plan to discuss with you, one, the nature of the violation, two, possible abatement measures you may take to correct the violation, three, possible abatement dates you may be required to meet, and four, any potential penalties the area director may issue the area director is the only one that can issue the citation, the final citation. So it's more often than not what you learn in the closing conference about these four items, nature of the violation, abatement measures you might be able to take, possible dates, and any potential penalties. Chances are that that could change slightly after they go back and do some more research and, and come out with the citations, um, if any. Should you receive a citation and notification of penalty, you must post this or a copy of it at or near the place or as close as possible where each violation of occurred to make employees aware of the hazards to which they may be exposed. This is an OSHA requirement. 
The citation must remain posted in a place where employees can see it for three working days or until the violation is corrected, whichever is longer. Keep in mind, Saturdays, Sundays, federal holidays are not counted as working days. So if you if you get it in the mail on Thursday, you're posting it Thursday, Friday, and Monday. So it's going to be up over the weekend. Some other things to consider, don't interfere with employee interviews. Under the Occupational Safety and Health Act, OSHA has the right to question employees privately. Supervisors, however, do have the right to request uh, a member of management or even legal counsel. Be careful, you do not appear to be coaching or intimidating employees, okay? I always held a brief meeting with employees and the with the compliance officer present to introduce them and to explain that the only expectation the company has is that the employees, uh, should they be interviewed, are to be cooperative and professional and that their conversation is kept private and confidential. And that was it. I wanted, I was made, made it very clear that the compliance safety and health officer understood that the company supports, you know, their role in this process and recognizes their right to conduct an inspection. Something else yet you need to know and understand is that OSHA only has six months from learning of a hazard to issuing a citation. So you have that right to a timely notification. So if OSHA decides to issue a citation on the seventh month, during the seventh month post inspection or post, you know, the last time, you know, they claim they were, you know, made aware of the violation, that actually won't stick. You have a legal avenue, legal recourse there to have that abated. But that doesn't mean that the violation wasn't real or didn't occur. It just means that they did not meet their requirement under the law to notify you within six months. So keep that in mind. Check the date of uh, violations when the certified mail comes to be sure. Make sure you document that. Once you get the violation or alleged violations in written form known as citations, there's only 15 working days for you to file a notice of contest if you wish to do, do so. Now, it has to be in writing. This is why it is critical, absolutely critical, that you do this one thing, regardless of whether or not you're going to just write the check and say, yep, you caught us, we did it, we already fixed it, but you know, here's the bill, uh, here's the uh, payment. You're still going to want to exercise your right to an informal conference to discuss any uh, citations or work that you've done to abate them. You may also contact or contest citations before an independent review commission, but this has to be requested ASAP. I always tell employers, even if you're going to, I can't repeat this enough times, even if you're going to agree with the citations, always go down for an informal conference and sit in front of the area director and have that conversation because it's a great opportunity to show OSHA that you're committed to improving workplace safety and, and can even negotiate and enter into an informal settlement agreement. So this will always have some sort of training requirement attached, but be prepared to invest in time and resources, not just expect to, to smile and get a good neighbor discount. Now that said, the area director is authorized to reduce any proposed penalties by up to 50% with an informal settlement agreement. And I've negotiated many of these and even had some proposed citations vacated, as, as I, I told you about one that happened in Columbus years ago. You know, and that was all done during these informal conferences after bringing evidence and, and arguing an interpretation of the standard. Sometimes that can be risky, but we were right, so it made sense to do it at the time. And I think it's how you do it that makes sense. But look, always, always, always request an informal conference to go down there to learn more about, you know, how you can better manage uh, these violations going forward. If you haven't already done so, you know, you can get some information on what they think um, could be done. But furthermore, as I said, it shows a good faith effort. And so it should always be the last time OSHA sees you or, you know, a representative of your company shouldn't be after they've left finding some citations or violations, I should say. All right. It should be, you know, they send a certified mail, do all the paperwork, uh, and then they just get a check in the mail. You know, I've had compliance officers for years tell me, yeah, they're probably going to see that employer again, you know. 
Um, it's they like it when you come down and visit them. They like it when you collaborate with them and you show that, you know, look, safety and health is important. OK, so remember that you only have 15 working days to do this. So get on the horn right away. Go down to the area office, sit in front of them, have that conversation. And then you've, you're off to the races. OK. Another thing, don't retaliate against any worker for exercising their rights under the act. This is key. All right. If employee violations of company rules are at play, always ask OSHA about the retaliation rules if in doubt. Okay. This may be needed as a result of any investigations, but you know, if you're going to discipline employees because they violated known rules, you have evidence that you've written people up and corrected even verbally violations that are similar from other employees. You have a, a history of enforcing your own policies and procedures. It just so happens that OSHA caught you know, saw this violation during the inspection before you did, you know, there's a very, there's an affirmative defense that's uh, hard to get over, but you can try it. And it's known as uh, unforeseen employee misconduct. You can say, Hey, no, we were pulled away from the shop floor when you showed up. You know, normally you know, I've got for this week, we've got several examples of corrective actions. We've had this quarter. Uh, we walked out one employee for violating these similar rules. We, we have a track record of finding and fixing these, and it was just bad timing. Look, you can have that conversation. It's okay, but I'm going to tell you right now, if you're going to go with, I'm going to use extreme language here, if you're going to go with blame the employee for the violation, you better bring it. You better bring documentation showing that you re routinely and frequently inspect, audit, and uh, assess your areas and correct employees and you have a pretty robust progressive disciplinary action process in place that is well documented to be able to show that, to establish that, okay? But that's something you can do. But I'm going back to what I started with is make sure that anything you do is in a knee-jerk reaction where, hey, we got an OSHA citation because something you shouldn't have done and we're going to discipline you. Well, you could be opening yourself up to a possible discrimination case. All right, look, let's wrap this up. You know, I'm going to give you a pro tip, okay? A best, the best way to handle everything I just said. Take everything I just said and ran down. Look at the show notes. They're bullet, bulleted for a reason, so it's easy for you. But a pro tip is simulate OSHA inspections, okay? The best way to train is to simulate. Prior to OSHA knocking on the door, practice the procedures that will, you'll need to take when a compliance officer does arrive. You can use outside help for this too. I don't care if you use a consultant, be careful with consult. I, I was a consultant and I'm telling you, be careful with consultants. Insurance underwriters, insurance reps can actually offer some assistance here. If you're in a state run workers comp, uh, under a state run workers comp system, you can request, you know, for free more often than not. I know in Ohio BWC, it's um, a lot of these safety services are free for policyholders, uh, services they offer, but look, here's what you want to do. You, you just think about it. Um, have them come in. They will inspect the workplace as part of their coverage policy anyway. So why not communicate to staff and employees that, hey, this is also a mock audit, you know, mock OSHA audit. We want to treat it as such. So we're going to have our underwriter, our insurance rep come in and do a wall-to-wall uh, -wall, and we're going to do it like a mock audit. You're going to do everything from asking for credentials and identification, have them sign in, you're going to have an opening conference. You're going to have them request certain documents. And you're going to have to go and fetch those and present those. You're going to go through the whole, you know, nine yards. This is what you're going to want to do, okay? Ask them to add some activities that to their visit that the compliance sa uh, health uh, safety officer might conduct, right? This might include, but not limited to, instructing your front office personnel to practice greeting the compliance officer, I'm using air quotes because it's a mock audit, but you know, in a polite manner, train staff to answer questions concisely, conduct uh, mock interviews with employees. It's a great way to find out how much, how much your employees actually know about your policies and procedures and safety programs. You think you do a lot of great, you know, great work with orientations. You got a real snappy PowerPoint. Looks great. I, you know, you worked three and a half hours on that PowerPoint template just to get the font right and the color right. And they don't remember any of it. So, look, it's a great way to gauge that. It's also, um, you also can conduct, you know, you could practice 
what you'll discuss during the opening and closing conferences and your demeanor and you know how you should communicate with them. Chances are an inspection will go smoothly, okay? If you prepare your facility by having documents ready or having a digital management system that's easy to understand and intuitive and multiple people have access to it. Also by correcting hazards before the visit, uh, simulating the inspection process, you're going to be in a better position, okay? Now, taking these precautions won't eliminate the possibility of any citations, but look, the compliance officer might view your effort as, you know, good faith, making it easier to manage any hiccups during the inspection process. So put your fears to rest and prepare, 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 okay? Go through these notes, bullet by bullet, ask yourself, look into your organization and say, how, how do we handle and manage this now? Who do we have on this shift and that shift? And what about weekends? Do they understand how to get a hold of me? And when I go out of town, if I'm the only safety you know, manager or uh, rep for the company, who's my backup when I go out of town? Have a business continuity plan in place and account for a compliance officer showing up or EPA showing up, something like that, a, a regulatory inspection showing up. Have a workflow, a very well-defined workflow. Uh, I don't care if you use a flow chart or numbered items or what format you put it in, but have a sort of a crisis management plan, if you will, that accounts for this type of activity. And then identify those needed to be trained and maintain that as people come in and leave and go um, you know, through the company. You're going to want to make sure that you have people in place according to that plan and train them and, and do this exercise. I recommend quarterly. You do quarterly drills anyway across the business. This should be one of them that you hit during the year at some point. Okay? Hey, look. Share with me some of the things that you do to get ready for an OSHA inspection. Um, if you've got old war stories, I love hearing those too. Shoot me an email, info at thesafetypropodcast.com. That's also where you're going to find our website, thesafetypropodcast.com. Let me know what you think. And until the next Safety Pro Podcast episode, as always, be safe out there. <laughs>